Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Churchill Library and Center. My name is Michael Bishop, and I'm the director of the library and the executive director of the International Churchill Society. The library, as many of you know, is the result of a collaboration between the society and the university. And since our opening two years ago, we have offered students and visitors alike access to primary documents, the entire Churchill archive online, original art artifacts and documents on display over there. And of course, we've had a series of Churchill conversations with extraordinary figures, including David Rubenstein just last night, David Petraeus, the novelist Robert Harris, the historians Tim Snyder and Neil Ferguson, former Foreign Secretary Lord Owen. And tonight, of course, we're honored to welcome Jesse Norman. Uh, I'm, I've been particularly looking forward to this event because Jesse, a few years ago, wrote a biography of Edmund Burke, a statesman I admire more than almost any other. And uh, it's particularly nice to welcome him here to talk about Adam Smith. Um, we have these conversations to sort of live up to Churchill's admonition that the f longer you can look backward, the farther you can look forward. We are trying to put in this library history in action. Jesse Norman is the Conservative Member of Parliament for Hereford and South Herefordshire and Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for the Department of Transport. He was Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy from 2016 until 2017. Before his election to Parliament in 2010, he was a director of Barclays during its reputable years, I hasten to add, <laughs> and taught at University College London. He is the author of several books, including the aforementioned Edmund Burke, The First Conservative, and The Big Society, The Anatomy of the New Politics. He suffers the grievous handicap of having been educated at Eton and Oxford and holds a PhD in philosophy from University College London. A recent review in The Spectator called him, quote, one of only three or four genuine intellectuals on the Tory benches in the House of Commons. Imagine how lonely he would be in the House of Representatives. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome Jesse Norman, MP. Uh, well, thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Michael, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here and have a chance to talk to you about uh, one of my great heroes, this fella, Adam Smith. And I should say, uh, in kicking off, that I don't do so as a parliamentarian or as a minister in uh, Her Majesty's government uh, or indeed as a, someone involved in politics at all, but I do it as someone who is uh, interested in ideas uh, interested in political economy and philosophy and interested in the impact that these ideas can have uh, in our lives today. The fascinating thing about Smith is that, uh, and I want to emphasize this and put it forward for your favorable consideration, is that he is a treasure trove uh, of uh, brilliant uh, thinking that has uh, applicability not only in his own time, but even today with many of the intractable and difficult, or apparently intractable and difficult problems that we see uh, in our world. Um, so let me start then by uh, saying that Smith is famous really uh, as the father of economics, and that's how I've described him uh, in the title of this book. But uh, he's also someone who is by far the most influential economist uh, who's ever lived. So if you look at the citations that have been given uh, of uh, the influence, that measure the influence of different economists, uh, uh, you can see the numbers given to uh, such luminaries as John Maynard Keynes or uh, Milton Friedman, Kenneth Arrow, Hayek, Marx, uh, and the rest of them. And Smith while vastly outpaces uh, any of these. And in fact, <coughs> his citation level uh, runs significantly higher uh, than the next three uh, Keynes, Marx, and Hayek uh, put together. So Smith is uh, a, a figure that bestrides the world of economics and political economy. And the effect of that has been that he's become enormously, not prestigious, not really prestigious, but important to be associated with particular uh, ideas and themes. And so uh, he's found himself the subject of misappropriation from across the political 
uh, spectrum. And the result has been a series of uh, caricatures. Uh, so one has been the idea that Smith, you find this on the right of the political spectrum, uh, often is that Smith is a great laissez-faire economist, a libertarian uh, whose great genius is Elaine in uh, releasing the world from the utopian delusions of socialism uh, and uh, communism. Uh, another uh, caricature on the other side of the spectrum, or what you might call the left-wing side of the spectrum, is that Smith is a market fundamentalist who is an apologist for greed and selfishness uh, and human inequality. And uh, therefore, uh, what we have between these two is an astonishing dichotomy of views. He clearly can't be both of these things, and I am going to uh, save you uh, any vulgar suspense, ladies and gentlemen, by um, suggesting that actually he's none of these things. Uh, and that, of course, then raises the question, well, what is Smith? Who was Adam Smith? And uh, why should we care about him? And I want to start by saying that that prestige that we see uh, manifests itself uh, in our lives uh, in England on a 20-pound note, in different uh, publications, in institutes, uh, and in the rest of uh, it, uh, it, because this is a person of astonishing depth. And it was recognized so in his own time. There's a wonderful story about uh, William Pitt the Younger. So after The Wealth of Nations was published, uh, Pitt made some uh, quite vigorous attempts to start to incorporate these radical new uh, open market ideas and to liberate trade with France. And I'm afraid it didn't come to much uh, in the 1780s, but as part of that, he invited uh, Smith, or Smith was invited to a great gathering uh, in Wimbledon of the uh, luminaries of the British cabinet, and uh, it had uh, assembled uh, great figures such as Addington and Grenville and Dundas uh, and uh, Pitt himself. And when Smith came into the room, Pitt and everyone else stood up, and Smith said, gentlemen, please be seated. And Pitt replied, no, no, you must first be seated, for we are all your scholars. So that understanding of Smith as something deep and quite apart uh, was embedded even in his own time. But this book isn't just, a, 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 as it were, a life of Smith himself. It's also a life of his times. And he lived through an extraordinary moment in uh, British history, uh, the 18th century, particularly in Scotland, marked by an amazing uh, succession of events and circumstances that um, ha have shaped not merely Smith's thinking, but also our modern world as well. Start with uh, the Union of 1707. Uh, now, that was the point at which uh, Scotland, which had had a very difficult time in the preceding 10 or 15 years, uh, there was the um, ill-fated Darien expedition, the failure of which took out about a quarter of the circulating capital in Scotland. That was Scotland's attempt to found an empire in its own right. Uh, there had been famines in Scotland in the 1690s. And by the time uh, um, of 1707, uh, she is ready as a country, it is ready as a country to form a union, an incorporating union, not merely a union of crowns, which had existed when James VI of Scotland had come down to London to be James I in 1603, but an incorporating union which, which actually merged the two countries into a single polity. And the Scottish Parliament after that, of course, was disbanded. But Scotland retained many of the institutions that had made it uh, as distinctive as it was. And they included uh, its educational system, broadly speaking, the best in the world at the time, uh, and uh, its um, system of law. So you have the Union of 1707, and that was a moment at which Scottish uh, economic growth, uh, after a period of readjustment to uh, its uh, association with England, uh, suddenly uh, began uh, a slow progress. Uh, by, the 1840, by the 1740s and 50s, that is becoming rapidly accelerating, and uh, it proves to be a process of growth which takes Scotland over the next 150 years um, from the lower end of the tree in European uh, wealth terms right up to the very top in terms of income uh, per capita. So uh, Scotland is the Asian tiger of its era. And of course, Smith takes this as, a, as something to be explained. How is it possible that a country can go through a process of such rapidly accelerating uh, economic development? He doesn't see the latter part, and he dies in 1790. But by 1776, it's obvious to him that something remarkable is taking place. And that's why the Wealth of Nations is, in part, a defense of 
that process of um, commercial, the creation of a commercial society, um, but also a, a deep analysis as to its basic causes. So you have the Union of 1707. I have particular um, gratitude, my own mind, to the Union of 1707 because it provides you with the perfect answer in the House of Commons to, uh, as it were, hostile questions from the Scottish Nationalist uh, Party. Um, uh, I remember doing uh, uh, a question uh, just before Prime Minister's questions on a Wednesday uh, in uh, Parliament. And at that point, there are something like 600 MPs in a very small chamber. There's an enormous amount of noise going on. Um, you can hardly hear yourself think. I get a question from the Scottish Nationalist uh, corner of the uh, chamber. I have absolutely no idea what the question is. Um, I've got the Prime Minister sitting behind me. Um, <laughs> I'm on national television, and I've got about a second and a half to make a decision as to how to answer. It's an interesting challenge. I encourage you all to <laughs> contemplate that and uh, reflect on it. Um, and, and suddenly, in my panic, a thought came into my mind, and I said, I can do no better than to refer the honorable gentleman to the words of his immortal uh, compatriot, Adam Smith, when he said that the union of 1707 is a measure from which infinite good has been derived uh, to this nation. I then sat down. The House of Commons went into uproar. All my colleagues were absolutely delighted. The Prime Minister was thrilled, and we moved on. <laughs> I'd managed to get out of that horrible hole. So the Union of 1707 um, is, the, is, in a way, the founding economic fact of Scotland in the 18th century. Um, but, of course, it's a country that is very much uh, divided uh, uh, through the, at least the first half of that. It's divided on religious grounds, uh, Episcopalians versus uh, Presbyterians versus uh, Catholics. Uh, it's divided between the Highlands and the Lowlands, the Highlands speaking Gaelic, the Lowlands speaking English, um, uh, the clans versus, uh, as it were, ordinary Lowland Scots. Uh, and then you have, of course, um, the Jacobite rebellions. And they are the rump of believers in the Stuart monarchs, now in exile in France, um, who wish to bring uh, those uh, uh, kings back. And notably, uh, in 750, uh, 1715, eight years before Smith is born, uh, you get a Jacobite rebellion. You get a lot of other kind of uh, um, agitating. And in 1745, there is a very serious rebellion left, led by Bonnie Prince Charlie, which makes its way um, as far as Derby, barely 110 miles or so from London, and then turns back, uh, um, misled by some perfidious English misinformation, um, which had suggested there was a large army in the region. And it's uh, interesting to note that fake news was an important part of, uh, important part of uh, political decision making uh, even then. So you have that. Um, you have the Seven Years' War, um, uh, which, uh, in a way, the, true, the, the first global, the true First World War, 1756 to 63, um, and the astonishing year of 1759, in which um, uh, Britain, uh, fighting the French with some uh, great success across four continents, win fantastic victories um, off uh, Lagos in Portugal, um, uh, Quiberon Bay, and, of course, uh, General Wolfe. Uh, defeating uh, General Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham and taking Quebec. So that is a moment at which the first British Empire is starting to be laid. Um, and that's uh, a, a foundational uh, fact, of course, not merely for the British, but also from the Americans, because it's this Seven Years' War that creates the overhang of debt that requires the British, the British think they have to pay back or at least start to um, push back on. That means... Uh, uh, savings have to be made. Those savings can be made, uh, are not enough. Uh, taxation needs to be introduced, including, guess what, taxation on the colonies. And so, of course, you get the slow uh, uh, movement increasingly fast towards the loss of the American colonies beginning in 1765. Um, and, of course, uh, every member of parliament thinks about that moment when they have to stand up and make a speech, a maiden speech in front of their colleagues uh, for the first time in the House of Commons, and it was the uh, uh, repeal, it was the debate on the repeal of the Stamp Act in which Edmund Burke made his own maiden uh, speech, uh, as he said, like a man drunk, uh, and then um, began to establish his astonishing parliamentary reputation. So that is the context of this uh, amazing um, uh, historical moment. Uh, but of course, no part of it was more amazing than uh, what has come to be known as the Scottish Enlightenment. And the Scottish Enlightenment is that amazing flowering of talent uh, that existed uh, throughout the 18th century, uh, and of which the humming engine room 
is Adam Smith and his great friend and in many ways mentor, David Hume, the philosopher David Hume. So uh, it's, um, they, they, the, intellectually, they are at the heart of the Enlightenment, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment, but that process also includes other great figures, uh, Adam Ferguson, William Robertson in history, uh, Hugh Blair in the beginnings of English literature being developed uh, out of Smith's ideas in many ways in Scotland. That's a story that I tell in the book quite separate to the one about political economy. Um, Hutton, the great geologist, Black, the great chemist. These are astonishing figures. Uh, and um, uh, they are um, all, interestingly, uh, uh, figures in conversation directly or indirectly with each other. And we focus on Hume and Smith because, um, I suppose, because intellectually, inevitably, they are two of the most uh, distinguished people who ever lived. Uh, and Hume is a, if I was giving an, a, an award, an Oscar for best supporting actor in this book, uh, it, would go for, it would go to David Hume, um, uh, who is uh, not just uh, one of the deepest and most brilliant philosophers ever, probably one of the two or three deepest and most brilliant philosophers ever to have written in the English language, but also wildly funny and engaging and uh, lively figure. Um, there's a marvelous moment uh, when uh, Hume, uh, having published his Treatise of Human Nature, one of the greatest works of English language philosophy ever, um, to some success but not enough, then recasts these ideas uh, into a series of essays, moral, political, and liter literary. Um, and they're really quite successful and sell very well, but he's not satisfied with that, and so he decides he's going to write a history of England on the model of the Continental Masters um, in six volumes, and that is an absolute smash hit. He makes a total fortune, um, buys a huge house in the grandest part of the new town of Edinburgh, and um, uh, uh, basically, um, in many ways, um, shuts up shop, um, uh, and, um, and, and gets on with the important business of living his life. Uh, uh, and um, Hume uh, uh, is a, uh, the joy of that is that um, Hume is then implored by his publisher to write a seventh volume. Strawn writes to him and says, will you write? He says, I have four reasons for not writing, says Hume. He says, I am too old, too fat, too lazy, and too rich. <laughs> and what I love about that is that's a sentence that so many authors over the years have wanted to write to their <laughs> publishers. Uh, and it, it takes David Hume, it takes David Hume to put it into, um, into, 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 into words. Um, so uh, Hume is a, is a master, um, but also, of course, Burke. Um, and Burke and uh, Smith uh, are um, uh, mutually admiring of each other, and they grow into being really quite close friends uh, uh, later on in the uh, 1770s and 80s. Um, and Burke pays a very handsome tribute to Smith. He says, oh, sorry, sorry, Smith pays a very handsome tribute to Burke. He says, Mr. Burke is the only man who thinks on all subjects, uh, economic subjects, exactly as I do, without any previous communication having passed between us. And although I don't think that's quite true, it hints at the deep affinity between uh, the two men. Um, and of course, they have more in common than just a belief in different ideas. Um, they have that astonishing thing you find often where an outsider is the most insightful person into a society. I mean, it's famously true of dictators that, as you may know, that they come from societies outside the one where they uh, have taken control. So Stalin was a Georgian, not a Russian, and um, Napoleon was a Corsican and not a Frenchman, and um, Hitler was an Austrian and not uh, a German. Um, and that acuity of social and psychological understanding uh, is something that, um, in a completely different context, intellectually, Burke and uh, um, uh, Smith both share. Burke, of course, an Irishman from a mixed background, mother a Catholic, father a Protestant, grows up in Dublin, um, comes to London, and you know, by the age of 35, has found himself a member of parliament uh, and the right-hand man to the Prime Minister of Great Britain. <laughs> Astonishing achievement. And this is at a time, you have to understand, where the conventional assumption was that an Irishman coming to England was on the lookout um, either for your uh, fortune or your daughter. So it's a significant achievement to have been able to do that. Um, Burke, um, on his side, then matched by Smith, a Scot, again, with enormous insights into that English society and the English um, uh, political economy. Uh, and what is fascinating is the two of them also uh, the pivots for our modernity themselves. So 
Um, if you want to think about our economic modernity, that comes with Smith, not because the wealth of nations. The wealth of nations is an uh, intergalactically comprehensive treatment of many of the ideas that we take, of, take to be central to political economy, politics, uh, economic theorizing now, division of labor, um, uh, uh, um, being one example, um, specialization, the invisible hand, all these great ideas you find. Um, but uh, the thing that really marks Smith, all these ideas have antecedents, the thing that really marks Smith as that hinge of our economic modernity is that he puts markets at the center of economic theorizing. In parallel, the thing that makes Burke the hinge of our political modernity is that he puts representative government and political parties at the center of our political theorizing. And if you think about democracy, it can be defined in different ways. Um, but the most fruitful, I think, and interesting way of thinking about it is that it's the process by which you can change your government after a general election. And that becomes formalized and settled in the modern context with the emergence of political parties. And Burke himself was not merely a theorist of political parties. He was running as a party manager, the Rockingham Whigs, um, between uh, 1766 and 1782. So he knew whereof he spoke uh, practically as well as intellectually. And if we think about states around the world that we would regard as uh, radically anti-democratic, why are they so? Not because they don't uh, have some respect for the forms of voting or waiting and things like that, but because they don't have political parties. North Korea, China, and the rest of it. So those two men have an astonishing parallelism about them. Uh, and I tell that story in the book uh, as well, as I do also um, the story of the astonishing antipathy which existed between Adam Smith and Dr. Johnson. But that's another story. So why then do we care about Adam Smith? What does he say and why does it matter to us? Um, now, Smith, in his own lifetime, published only two books, The Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759 uh, and The Wealth of Nations in 1776. The first is a book not of moral philosophy, often mis, I think, understood. Um, not, let's be perfectly clear, neither book read by almost anyone. Um, uh, the second book, very widely quoted, um, uh, but neither book read. Uh, and uh, it, the first book is really a work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments is really a work of moral psychology. So it really thinks, it tries to answer the question, where do our moral values come from? Where do our social norms come from? Uh, and th to that question, Smith pose, uh, gives the following answer, which is uh, they come from ourselves. Th this is all there is. They come from social interactions. They are natural um, results of uh, human beings interacting with each other. How can that happen? Uh, because when humans interact with each other, they exchange. And the exchange in, in the moral case is an exchange of esteem or regard. So when a human being is acting in a way you want to think of as moral, they are seeking the approbation of others. As he says, humans desire not merely to love, but to be lovely. And that is worthy of love, the worthy object of love by others. Um, and of course, it's that process of wanting others' esteem and knowing that they are aware that you want their esteem and you are aware that they want, that they are aware that you want their esteem and so on, that creates, uh, as it were, conventions and social norms. And that's proved to be an extraordinarily powerful idea. That's leavened by uh, um, the idea, another idea that he puts out, which is the idea of uh, an impartial spectator. So if you just had a situation in which people sought each other's esteem, then morality would simply be a matter of the conventional wisdom at any particular time. But Smith's view is not that. Smith's view is that it uh, is a more universal phenomenon than that, and therefore it has to correct for the particular idiosyncrasies of some person's uh, passions or desires or situations. To ask, as it were, what are the right things to do, not merely in the circumstances, what's the moral thing to do for anyone in that position rather than just this person? And those two ideas have proven to be astonishingly influential. So the uh, impartial spectator was a great uh, influence on Kant uh, when he comes to write the groundwork of the metaphysical morals. Um, he's thinking about what in human behavior uh, can be regarded as universalizable as the basis for, uh, um, as it were, moral uh, uh, injunctions, uh, sense of duty. Um, and when you think about um, modern social psychology, and the formation of norms or conventions, uh, of which there's an enormous literature now, um, Smith's idea that it's really about keying off each other in that way 
um, and the search for approbation is an astonishingly influential one, often misunderstood, often, um, I think, without uh, 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 people understanding how deep that idea is or where it comes from. So Smith, um, I think, can be justly regarded not merely as the father of political economy, but the father of social psychology as well. That's the first book. Second book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, the most um, influential work of uh, social science ever created, 1776. And somehow the suggestion has come that these two books are um, uh, often uh, uh, are somehow opposed to each other. The first book was a book about, um, a, on this view, altruism and, um, as it were, uh, moral uh, goodness and sympathy. And the second book, a work of um, defense of self-interest and greed. Um, and nothing could be further from the truth. This is not the right way to think about Smith. Uh, at all, and one, there are several reasons why we know it isn't. One is that he was thinking about some of the ideas of the wealth of nations because we know, because we have a contemporary reports of it, before he published the theory of moral sentiments. And the second is that he ends up revising both of these works through the rest of his life. So he doesn't just publish them, he's worried about them, he wants to expand them, he wants to make them better, and so he's constantly thinking about them. And of course, The Wealth of Nations includes a reference, you know, a page saying, if you like this one, try my theory of moral sentiments um, <laughs> in the modern era, uh, in modern style. And so the idea that these are somehow dis disjoint from each other is completely deranged, um, although surprisingly widely held. Now, um, if they're not disjoint from each other, what's the relationship of one to the other? The answer is the theory of moral sentiments sets a a moral psychological, uh, um, a general moral psychological way of understanding human behavior. And the wealth of nations then expands that to look at how human behavior, when it's also moderated by economic incentives, incentives of the desire to better one's situation in life, how those interact with each other. And it follows from that that um, Smith's understanding of markets is very different from the one that we see in contemporary economics today. So um, Smith can, can theorize with the best of them in terms of thinking in a distinctively economic fashion. But the idea that Smith's economics is all about abstract mathematical models, often locked up in spreadsheets, is a completely misleading view of his idea of markets. For Smith, a market is a cultural artifact. Um, it is a, uh, it is a, um, a mode of uh, exchange mediated by custom practice, habits, uh, moral values, social norms, uh, and the rest of it. And of course, it takes place in history. It doesn't, it's not something abstracted in some uh, spuriously scientific way from history. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because it provides a tremendous corrective against um, some of the uh, attempts to think of markets in a supposedly scientific way that lose so many of the aspects that actually Smith has put in there that are vitally important. Um, and once you restore the idea of norms, of social values as guides to conduct, you then start to be able to understand the full power of the Smithian picture. And if you drop it out, you, you fall into error. A little example, think about uh, norms of CEO pay. Okay, so in the 1970s, the idea that the chief executive of a large company would be paid a thousand times the uh, wage of uh, the average wage in the, his country, in his company, would have been regarded with absolute horror and amazement. Uh, but uh, all too often, we see astonishing amounts of CEO pay now in corporations. And by the way, completely unrelated to uh, stock market performance or um, uh, shareholder returns. So the question is, what's happened? Answer, the norm has changed. It's somehow become OK to do these things. And of course, um, many of the apologists to that position have told themselves um, a story about how we live in a meritocracy and it's a doggy dog world out there and there's a global uh, market for talent and therefore they're the natural inevitable results of this process. Of course, that's all nonsense. Most of these people are promoted from within their companies. There's no competitive process, whatever. Indeed, they spend most of their lives, as Smith diagnoses, trying to cut out competition, stop it wherever possible. So when, if you don't understand norms, you can't explain what's going on there. Um, uh, it's certainly rationally inexplicable in economic terms. Um, and the same is true when you look at the UK, where CEO pay has started to climb over the last 15, 20 years. Why? Because the norm transferred over to the UK. Okay, and some of the same thinking, not quite as badly, but some of the same thinking. And you can run the same argument in different aspects of the economy as well. Just a little example of what the benefit you get from seeing in the world in a, in a Smithian way. So you have that idea. Um, when you see these two books as connected in that way, then it becomes possible to understand the true force of the idea of political uh, economy. 
because political economy is not merely, uh, as it were, attention to the economic incentives involved. Uh, it's also uh, attention to the, um, uh, uh, to the um, political context in which those take place. And the link for Smith is the idea of property. So property rights become progressively elaborated. They are defended by uh, judicial processes and law, which is established. And that uh, set of processes um, means that markets evolve pari passu with the state. And the result of that is that the stronger the state, paradoxically, the stronger the economy can be using the property rights that are defended uh, uh, within that state. And that gives to Smith's overall conception an astonishing um, aspect of being essentially an evolutionary theory of social development. Uh, and that evolutionary theory is one that prefigures and deeply influenced Charles Darwin when he comes to develop the theory of evolution uh, in uh, uh, 50 or 60 years later. Um, and uh, it's one of those things that makes um, Smith's political economy uh, so much more nuanced than uh, the suggestion that it has uh, today. Now let's go on a little bit more just to talk about um, Smith's contemporary impact now and then, I'll, and then I'll wind up. Why then should we study Smith? What does Smith do for us? Um, well, the first thing I want to do is just to link the whole architecture of the thing together so you get a sense of how it all fits together. We've talked about the theory of moral sentiments. We've talked about the wealth of nations. But there are two other works um, never published in Smith's lifetime that it's worth just mentioning. The first is um, the lectures on rhetoric that he did um, early in his life in the 1750s. Um, and they are important because there you get the idea of human beings sympathetically adjusting to each other but in the area of language and communication and the sharing of ideas. Uh, and then, and the second uh, great work, which never published in his lifetime, and indeed a work which he uh, instructed his executors to burn at, um, just before his death, uh, is his work on jurisprudence. Um, Bur uh, Smith and Hume shared a commitment to one of the great Enlightenment projects, which was to create a science of man, a general explanation in the style of Isaac Newton, what Isaac Newton had done for physics and cosmology, they were going to do for all human behavior and thought. That is to say, to give it a, a rational uh, account, uh, which was derived from a small number of uh, governing assumptions that were widely held, uh, 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 and um, which had a structure which allowed it to be then recursively uh, elaborated into other areas of activity. And this gives us uh, the chance to see what the structure of that thought would be. Because the key idea, the idea that ties it all together, is the idea of exchange. So exchange of language, uh, linguistic uh, exchange, mediating communication and intellectual sharing of thought, um, uh, exchange in uh, sentiment, uh, of trading, of esteem, uh, and of regard in the moral theory, the moral psychology, and then finally exchange of goods and services in political economy, giving um, all of the benefits of markets that we find uh, in the wealth of nations. That's the governing architecture of his thought. And my speculation is that the reason why the, the lectures on jurisprudence, fascinating though they are, which are only available because of two sets of Samizdat student notes, which were discovered and then used to reconstruct them, um, one, my theory is that the reason why Smith never had that published was because it had never come to the level of finished thought uh, and could not be readily included within this exchange-mediated overall uh, structure to his ideas that he had wanted. It's nevertheless of extraordinary interest because of its relations I've described to the evolutionary ideals at the center of um, Smith's uh, thinking. Why then does this matter? Well, I think it matters um, for several reasons. The conventional understanding is that Smith uh, is, of course, a, um, a great supporter of free trade. And he is. Well, he's not naive about free trade. He's aware that tariffs can have their uses. But that's uh, one big use, uh, one big sense in which Smith is, uh, as it were, culturally and retains his importance today. And there are many who would say that if we retained a more Smithian attitude to free trade, um, uh, you know, we would uh, be able to avoid many of the troubles that uh, um, are potentially currently afflicting uh, this country. I'm not going to comment on that. I'm just going to say that it makes Smith a thoroughly relevant person <laughs> to think about uh, in this context. Um, but there are other areas in which I think we should think about Smith. One is 
by not having this one-size-fits-all idea of markets, Smith's able to be much more specific and punctilious about what's actually going on. Why does that matter? Because there are massive differences between what you might call haircuts and hamburger markets, where the good is consumed uh, and then another one bought again, bought at a single selling price, and asset markets where the good is never consumed, stocks and bonds and the rest, um, where there may be a seller's price and a buyer's price, uh, and where the structure of the market lends itself to um, some wild swings and gyrations and potentially to um, overshooting and undershooting. And that uh, a failure to understand the difference between those markets, I think, is a deep cause of the reason why um, the 2008 crash uh, occurred. There were specific reasons, but from the regulator standpoint, there was a feeling that somehow all markets would um, self-equilibrate in the classic Smithian style. Um, of course, th that isn't what happened, and we need a proper deep explanation for why it didn't happen that way, and one of them lies in the failure to attend to the difference between markets. Um, let me just pick on one final point, which is crony capitalism. So uh, Smith is not a theorist of capitalism. Um, and one of the things that you will discover when you read the book is that nothing you presently think about Smith uh, is true. And Smith is not a theorist of capitalism. He's not a laissez-faire economist. He's not a theorist of capitalism either. Um, uh, and that's what, there's a very simple reason for that, which is capitalism wasn't developed from the middle of the 19th century. Capitalism, you think of it as open markets plus agglomerations of corporate capital operating autonomously. That doesn't exist until the 18th century, uh, until, sorry, the middle of the 19th century. But, um, uh, and also, it's not what matters for Smith. What matters for Smith is the evolution of society and the, and the creation of commercial society. And commercial society is the moment at which um, a, a, a community emerges from feudalism, that is the personal dependence of one on another, um, might be the aristocrat, it might be the king, and moves to a point where he says, um, every man, of course it is always a man at that time, is in himself a uh, merchant and lives by exchanging. That is to say, a presumptively equal, recognizably modern world in which people trade on their own behalf and interact with each other uh, as equals. And what matters to Smith is not capitalism, but commercial society. And there's a very simple reason for that, which is that um, commercial society carries with it a theory of its own legitimacy. Um, commercial society succeeds because everyone does better. No one is locked out in any structural way from the benefits of that uh, social development. Um, and that's really important because I think all too often policymakers um, influenced by the idea of capitalism rather than the idea of commercial society are too comfortable to consider um, uh, uh, these um, uh, to consider commercial society, uh, to consider um, the, the fate of people uh, as it were um, in the way that uh, whether they win or lose whether that legitimacy is given through their participation in society as a whole. Um, so that's an important pivot. Commercial society is what matters for Smith uh, and not uh, capitalism. And um, I suppose the final thing to say uh, is that when you tie all that together, you end up with a view of capitalism which is uh, extremely avant la lettre, before it occurs, which is extremely nuanced and which contains within it a very trenchant critique of crony capitalism, focused on what we might describe now as rent extraction, that's uh, corporations getting too close to government and using that to generate super competitive returns for themselves, um, uh, asymmetries of power uh, and information. Uh, well, think of the platforms, the uh, technology platforms now. In his own time, that would be the difference between the masters of companies and the employees or the workers and companies. He's always on the workers' side. He's much more egalitarian uh, than people think. Um, and of course, principal agent problems. We pay these people to do a job for us, and they walk off with our money. And he's extremely rude about all of those three things. And that provides yet another reason for thinking that Smith is not merely um, someone with uh, ideas that have astonishing relevance today, but a profoundly attractive and wise thinker who behooves us all to study. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much, Jesse. I'd like to uh, offer the audience an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. But before we do that, uh, I must ask you one thing, since you already touched upon the relationship between Burke and Smith, I'm going to uh, put you on the spot and ask you about that other B word from which no British politician can escape, especially here, Brexit. Uh -huh. uh, 
Brexit, the Brexit project has been ongoing now for two years. It, it uh, in some ways, has been foundering on the rocky shoals of markets and trade and borders and many of the things with which Smith concerned himself. I'm wondering, do you think that the uh, works of Adam Smith might provide a roadmap through the thickets of Brexit? I think um, uh, what is fascinating about Smith is his analysis and his principles. Um, you could ask the question, what would Smith do in a given circumstance, is um, more of a parlor game than a process of intellectual analysis. And um, you, know, you can always ask the question, oh, you know, um, what would Smith think of Beyonce or Love Island or you know, the hijab or one of those things? And I, I rather put this into that context. Um, Smith is such a, uh, an omnivorous and wide-ranging thinker that uh, he is, uh, we must consult him on both sides of the argument. So a very simple way of thinking of it would be to say, um, Smith, above all, understands that the level of specialization, therefore the idea of the amount of value added that you get from a market, um, is a function of how deep it is. Now, if you take a very short-term uh, perspective, um, leaving the single market, if that's what Brexit involves, um, takes you away from the deepest markets that are presently available to the UK, and Smith might have a worry about that. Um, on the other hand, um, Smith's acutely aware of the benefits of economic growth and orienting towards faster growing markets around the rest of the world um, has a, uh, a Smithian uh, explanation associated with that as well. You can see why that might be the case. The, purpose, the, the point I think is most interesting is um, that moment, uh, uh, which, uh, a moment which illustrates the other side of the equation, the non-economic side, which Smith is also highly attuned to. Uh, and that is the moment uh, in 1778 where um, the Brits have just been duffed up uh, at the Battle of um, Saratoga, I'm afraid to report, uh, and um, uh, they, uh, they solicit Smith's advice for what to do about this troublesome situation that's developing in the American colonies. And um, Smith writes a, uh, the very model of a uh, modern policy paper, which scouts four uh, potential alternatives and then um, chooses one and suggests it, what, it, what it would be. And the, 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 the um, approach that he favours um, uh, is the idea of an incorporating union between Britain and its American colonies to form one country, and as England had done with Scotland. And uh, the reason he likes that is because he says very simply, look, um, if uh, the concern amongst the American colonies is that uh, the um, uh, present situation creates taxation without representation, then let them have representation. Um, he says, I don't think it's going to happen, but I think that's my preferred uh, alternative. Um, and then he says, but of course, uh, if that is uh, the approach that's adopted, uh, sovereignty must inevitably shift over time from Great Britain to the, uh, uh, <laughs> to the, to the colonies. Uh, and um, I think that's uh, an acute understanding of some of the concerns that my <laughs> colleagues have about the process of Brexit with regard to the EU. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, we'll come to you with a microphone. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I have a lady here in the front. That was superb. Thank you so much. It seems that there's a little bit of a dichotomy between the idea of, uh, of uh, kind of reverting to the mean through norms and evolution. So where does the evolution come from if everyone is trying to please everyone else by, by um, being normal? Um, uh, it's a great question. So um, when uh, uh, people are seeking to um, earn the esteem of others, um, they are... I don't think uh, one should necessarily assume that that traps them in a particular um, equilibrium. Smith is not an equilibrium theorist. Smith is a theorist about the movement to equilibrium, but his position is a fundamentally dynamic one. And so I don't think he ever thinks that um, human nature will mean that uh, society or human thought will ever sit still. So the question is, as it, um, as it were, incorporates and um, the, the previous set of understandings and esteem, where does it go from there? How does it pivot off that previous one? And we see this constantly in, um, uh, in our societies uh, today. I mean, uh, you know, um, people used to feel very comfortable about um, uh, littering. Now they don't feel very comfortable about littering. Uh, people used to feel very comfortable about dropping plastic bags in the ocean. Now they don't feel very comfortable about dropping. You know, this is a constant description of how, and of course, our norms also change. I mean, look at the Me Too movement and the way in which women have been treated in uh, 
um, you know, the entertainment industry and things like that. Things that have been out there and have been the reflection of power become perfectly properly uh, matters of intense public scrutiny and reaction. And I think that that is something that naturally accommodates itself within the Smithian picture, even within this wider picture of, as it were, the progressive evolution of, on the economic side, of property rights and, and government that goes with that. The gentleman down the aisle. I, there was a uh, review of your book in the Wall Street Journal, and it mentions that uh, uh, Smith gave orders that all of his papers should be burned. You alluded to that with respect to the letters on jurisprudence, but I was just wondering if uh, you had any, if, if that means we have no insight as to why he might have done that. Well, uh, we don't, um, Smith didn't say I'm having these works destroyed because dot, dot, dot. So we have to speculate as to why, <laughs> as to why he did. And, I, and I've given my uh, speculations. Smith's a very private man. And actually, he regarded um, personal reputation as a form of private property. Um, uh, and so uh, what, what he called a jus sincerae aestimationis, a right to an unblemished estimation by others. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the reasons why he was so jealous about preserving a particular presentation of his own work. I, think, I don't think he liked the idea of, of giving people uh, material that could be, um, that was unfinished and could be a, a source of further, um, as it were, uh, scrutiny or potential uh, interrogation. Um, the result, bizarrely, of course, has been to have raised all kinds of questions about what he actually did that I'm sure he would never have preferred or liked in the first place. Um, when he had his works uh, destroyed, uh, as I've said, they very reluctantly were by his uh, executors. Um, I think the deeper, uh, the deeper reason may also have been that they, he wasn't able, he didn't have time to fit them into the wider architecture of what he hoped would be a single all-embracing theory. And, and I think that's quite, in a way, it's quite, that's quite an honorable thing. It, it's at odds with the modern confessional style of dying, um, but uh, not, I think, dishonorably so. Another question. Oh, here in the front. Hi, thank you. Uh, Anti-free trade is a criticism of President Trump by some people in America, on both sides of the aisle. Would you and would Smith agree that that's a legitimate intellectual terminology, anti-free trade for his efforts to improve bad deals? Well, I think you've got, I'm not going to comment on the White House's uh, current uh, um, the policy or not. Um, but I think, the, uh, I think what's interesting is that Smith's view overall is that free trade is beneficial to both parties and is not zero sum. And that's a view that's received a great deal of um, support over the following 200 years and latterly um, uh, academic as well as experiential support. Um, but that doesn't mean that Smith thinks that there's no case ever for, uh, as it were, um, trying to inflict a little damage on the other side in order to keep them honest. Um, and that's not a, I don't think that, uh, I don't think he particularly associates himself with that. He regards that as part of the, uh, cr the evil craft of that vulgar and insidious animal known as the politician or statesman, um, as he puts it. But he recognizes that can be something that can be beneficial if its effect is to return to um, as it were, um, conditions of um, effective free trade. Now, if it isn't, I mean, if the effect over time is to perhaps because it leads to tit for tat or a war or because the lobbies that it um, enfranchises by raising domestic prices and bringing certain industries closer to um, uh, government uh, become more powerful, then he would have a lot of worries about that because the potential, obviously, is that it raises prices and reduces economic activity and potentially enhances crony capitalism and rent extraction. So you have to be very careful about that. But I think his view would be, um, in principle, the possibility exists either way, and by their fruits shall we judge them. Another question. This gentleman here We're all on this side at the moment. I think we should allow some of these folks okay. before we get oh, an yes. insurrection from the other side <laughs> of the... Uh, Room, Michael. I'm glad that you uh, brought together uh, the more theory of moral sentiments and wealth of nations. I think it's a good thing to talk about not just financial markets, but that there are also, I guess you could call moral moral markets in some sense. Uh, so when there are some unsavory effects, like you mentioned, um, with high uh, corporate pay. Uh, 
and other things like that. What do you see right now happening um, where public opinion or something connected to the, maybe the impartial spectator is solving uh, those problems through the markets that are kind of discussed in the theory of moral sentiments? Does that make sense? Uh, it, not hugely, but um, uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably shouldn't say that. But let me riff gently on what I think you're talking mm -hmm. about. So, so um, Smith doesn't believe that all market activity is good. You know, Smith's a very vigorous and trenchant opponent of the slave trade, right? I have no doubt that if Smith had seen um, the evils that were inflicted on China in the cause of opening up trade there and the eventual spread of opium um, across the eastern of the British Empire, he would have been utterly appalled. Um, so so there, are, there are markets whose effect uh, and whose existence he would deeply deplore on moral grounds and, um, in some cases, certainly in the slave trade, on economic grounds. Um, so, so um, in other words, he regards it as not just morally bad, but economically unwise as well. So I think that's true. Um, what is fascinating about Smith, again, is that he's, con as a, the greatest thing, he's always thinking of both sides of the argument. So um, in markets, the instinct is to better one's condition, as he puts it. That's not just about self-interest. That's the ge a general consideration of how people um, live and, and the people around them and how they can do better, uh, as it were, in their lives. Um, uh, and not merely economically, um, but he's also and, and one of the things that fuels that is that uh, is is what he thinks of as the um, a slavish desire to admire the rich and the powerful. Okay, now that's one of those things where in in, in purely economic terms that can be quite helpful. That's the one of the a status ambition alongside a an economic ambition is uh, one of the things that you see uh, in people's lives. Um, but he doesn't think that's a good thing morally. And in fact, he thinks it breeds uh, materialism, which is ultimately at odds with human well-being. Um, so he's very interestingly running this parallel argument both sides. And he talks about um, he has this marvelous phrase. He repeats it more often in The Wealth of Nations, I think it is, than um, the phrase the invisible herd, which exi exists precisely once, um, or, or cited precisely once, um, uh, where he talks about trinkets of frivolous utility. <laughs> and, and he deplores the the, 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 the situation in which a person can have worked all their lives to acquire, as it were, money and status without knowing why and without being able to use it and utterly unconnected from any real sense of human well-being. And I think that's, a, again, a, an acute psychological and moral insight as well as an accurate description of economic behavior. And now on this side of the room, this gentleman here, the check shirt. Thank you very much. Um, I think you've made a very powerful argument that uh, Adam Smith is not a Milton Friedman or a Friedrich Hayek or an Ayn Rand, for God's sake, um, and that a lot of the leftist or Marxist critiques of Adam Smith are just sort of entirely off base. Um, and your comments about sort of his interest in culture and the embedded nature of markets and society are very interesting. And I wondered, it, it, it came to mind the arguments that Karl Polanyi argued about the, uh, the double movement. In fact, as markets get freer, you end up having a societal backlash um, as sort of life gets more difficult for those people who are engaging in free markets. And in fact, one of the benefits of being wealthy or otherwise socially uh, uh, privileged is that you craft laws such that you don't, do not actually have to deal with the terrifying power of fully competitive markets. The argument about crony capitalism, for example, sure. comes in. Um, and it also brings to mind sort of the development state uh, literature and political science regarding the East Asian tigers, in which you have culturally embedded institutions in highly competitive sort of massive conglomerates that are able sure. to sort of achieve this. So I wonder, uh, to what degree should we be thinking about Adam Smith less in terms of just a philosopher of free trade, among the other things that he is, um, but in terms of sort of the cultural embeddedness of markets and society? And to what degree is that a reassessment that might be necessary in terms of us thinking of how to move forward in 21st century economics? OK, so, so thank you for the question. I think the, um, in the case of Polanyi, I mean, uh, The Great Transformation is a work I, I discuss, actually, in, in the book. And um, you, you, know, you may be interested in it if, for that, if nothing else. And um, I, I think there's a, a lot of interest in, uh, there's of interest in, in Polanyi's diagnosis. Um, uh, I, I, I have worries about it. <clears throat> um, so I don't personally see. Um, the same thing that he does, which is the separation of politics and economics in some sense. Um, but I do see something, and, and actually it's been diagnosed by others, most recently Michael Sandel, um, with the evolution of society towards market society and the, pro the prolongation and promotion of commercial 
norms into areas that historically not been regarded as commercial. And that's a very deep worry. Um, uh, I think it's a worry now in terms of the kinds of norms that we've described, but it's also a worry at the time. It was a worry in the 18th century. Um, if you think about Rousseau, what is Rousseau doing? Rousseau's view is civilization is a total sham. Um, you know, human beings are going backwards. This is a source of corruption. Um, this is not a million miles away from that kind of worry, and you find the same thing in the classical author as well. So that's true. Now, if you, kind of, if you turn your attention to um, uh, uh, the Far East, um, you see, you see uh, of course, there's a, there's a kind of long tradition of airy condescension from, um, you know, Western economists about... Um, the Far East, as though these things are, you know, these arrangements are constantly breaching this, uh, you know, uh, eternally set up uh, Chicago uh, idea of how markets work. Uh, of course, to which one can say, well, um, there are things that are dreamt of, they're not dreamt of in your philosophy. Things on heaven and earth are not dreamt of in your philosophy, um, uh, Milton. And I think that's true. Um, uh, that isn't to say there aren't worries associated with it. And I'll just give you a, an example in the case of China. So um, one of the worries that people have is, well, look, um, uh, uh, China is m mounting a threat to the West, not merely economically, but intellectually. What it's trying to suggest is that the Western economic model of markets and um, democratic institutions sitting around them is intrinsically short-term uh, and incapable, as it were, of thereby discharging a truly efficient approach towards the building of long-term economic success. Um, through things like infrastructure projects and uh, um, you know uh, access to mineral rights and all the rest of it, um, and you can look at the way China has developed over the last twenty years, thirty years, and the Belt and Road Initiative and the like, and feel very easily an enormous degree of respect for the sheer ingenuity and energy with which they've pursued that um, agenda. But you can also feel a severe degree of worry about it, and um, Smith gives you the reason why, because. These societies are modern societies, but they're not commercial societies. And therefore, you would have to have a worry about when the growth stops, where are those deep tap roots of legitimacy, which is what sustains, which are what sustains the, um, the commercial society um, that he writes about. And I think that's a genuine worry now. And I think when growth starts to falter, um, as uh, many have thought it inevitably must, we may start to see some of those worries reappear. Thank you, Jesse. I'm afraid that's about all the time we have this evening. I'd like it if you would all mark your calendars, though, and return here on November 5th at 6 p.m. for the launch of the brilliant new biography, Churchill Walking with Destiny by Andrew Roberts. Uh, and I think we should also engage in a bit of uh, uh, tribute to Adam Smith by engaging in commerce and letting the invisible hand guide you to that table over there where you can purchase copies of Jesse's brilliant book. Uh, Edmund Burke said that a politician should be a philosopher in action, and I know of no politicians who've lived up to that admonition more honorably than Edmund Burke and Jesse Norman. Thank you very much for being with us this evening.